Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's Community Conversations panel, uh, Buddhist Visions, Art, Philosophy, and Religion. And on behalf of University Housing, I'd like to welcome all of you to our first Community Conversations panel for spring term. And in a minute, I'm going to thank our hosts this evening at the George Schnitzer Museum of Art. And we're very grateful to be hosted here in the museum this evening. There are several folks that I want to make sure I acknowledge before we introduce our panel this evening. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to mention that this particular community conversation panel was organized by the Hamilton Think Tank, uh, which is one of the student academic groups in University Housing Residence Life. And if anybody would like to join the Hamilton Think Tank, we're always looking for new ideas. So if you'd like to plan events such as this one, especially if you'd like to plan something for fall term, that's what we're working on now, we'd love to have you join us. We meet every Tuesday at 5 p.m. in the Collier Lounge. And so feel free to stop by. You can arrive late, leave early. We're a pretty informal group. We're just looking for your great ideas. Um, I'd also like to mention our co-sponsors that make this possible, the Robert D. Clark Honors College, the Oregon Humanities Center, and Undergraduate Studies have been generous supporters over the years of Community Conversations panel. Uh, this evening, as mentioned, many of you have already had a chance to participate on our guided tour of parts of the Buddhist Visions exhibition. And I want to make sure to thank uh, our two student docents this evening who uh, took us on two different groups, uh, Frankie and Jesse, and we're very grateful for them to spend time with us this evening as our group continued to grow as we were traveling through the exhibit. I also want to mention uh, the folks at the George Schnitzer Museum of Art that have been working with us for, I think, at least a term now uh, to coordinate this evening event, and they're standing in the back. Uh, Eric Hoffman, uh, the Director of Communications, uh, Lisa Abia Smith, Director of Education, Sharon Kaplan, the Museum Educator, and Miriam Jordan, Executive Assistant. And we're hoping to continue to expand our partnership in the future and, and come back to the George Schnitzer Museum of Art for some of the 75th anniversary events that are coming up in the new academic year. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our two speakers this evening. Uh, Hagina Hekobian, who is over here to our right, is uh, a Slavic librarian with the University Library Systems and is one of our library partners this evening. Uh, she's been uh, generous enough to put together a slideshow for us this evening that is also going to be available on the Community Conversations website. So we probably won't have time to get through all of it this evening. Uh, but if you'd like to, to refer to it after tonight, please visit the Community Conversations website and you'll be able to view it on there. Um, it's a slideshow of paintings by Nikolai Rorik, who is a Russian-born avant-garde painter whose work reflects his deep affinity for Buddhism. Uh, and uh, Hagina's uh, colleague in the Knight Library, Elizabeth Peterson, has also uploaded an annotated bibliography. So for those of you who had a chance to go on the tour this evening, if you'd like to read more about the exhibit and what you saw in the exhibit, uh, please visit the Community Conversations website. There's a bibliography titled Books on Buddhism Relevant to Buddhist Visions 2008 that was prepared by Claudia Lapp, who is an ex exhibition interpreter with the Schnitzer Museum. And after Hagina speaks briefly this evening, our main presenter is going to begin, and so I'm going to introduce him now, just so we can have a smooth transition. Uh, the Venerable Lobsong Tubten, who is here to my right, uh, will be our main presenter this evening. And he has prepared for us, and I had a chance to meet uh, for coffee, uh, a, a presentation titled The Buddhism of Tibet. Uh, and the Venerable Lobsong is a fully ordained Buddhist monk in the Tibetan tradition and he will be delivering this uh, multimedia presentation this evening. So uh, if you could join me in welcoming now our two <laughs> guests this evening. And Hagina, I'll turn it over to you. That's when his, uh, his paintings um, 
appear, appear to be full of blue, red, indigno colors. And that's when it was uh, uh, said uh, that his blue is the blue of the northern twilight. His green is the green of the seagrass. And his red is the red of pagan watch fires and his flame from Byzantine arrows. So by going to uh, Himalayas, he painted Himalayas in, in different times of the day. And he studied, started studying the, um, uh, the culture of, um, of Buddhism. He started studying uh, the lamas uh, and uh, also he started believing that the, uh, he started believing that there should be uh, uh, the peace of the culture. Even he drafted, <laughs> as you see after our tour in the museum, you can uh, see more colorful paintings done in oil. Uh, he uh, drafted a uh, rare craft which uh, formed the basis of the International Convention for uh, the Protection of, uh, of, of Culture and Cultural Values. Later that pact was signed in Hague. So, uh, and he believed and lived uh, for uh, uh, the peace through culture. So, uh, as uh, Kevin mentioned that you can um, uh, view and just get more familiar with these uh, paintings of Nikolai Rerev and his books which are available in the library later which will uh, on the website of our University of Oregon. And if you have any questions, you can just always ask us and we'll be just always there to help you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. So I feel like I've got all these gadgets hooked up to me now. Can everyone hear me? Okay. <clears throat> okay. My name is Venerable Love Sang. Um, people usually just call me Venerable or Venerable Love Sang. Um, that's that's the Tibetan title for a monk. Um, in Tibet, they would say Kusho Kusho La, which is Tibetan for Mister Monk. Um, one of the things that you guys may will find out later, but um, I'm also a student here at the University of Oregon, so some of you may see me wandering around in regular clothes um, so I don't distract you from wearing robes all over the campus. Um, so it's a double pleasure for me to be here and talk in front of you as well and to be invited here to do so. Um, I am a fully ordained monk. I'm, in the, I'm a Gelug monk. It's the same tradition that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is. Um, His Holiness is... is probably one of the most famous Tibetan Buddhist monks, uh, or just plain Buddhist monks that is living today, um, the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet, uh, Tenzin Gyatso. It's, his name means Ocean of Wisdom. He was given that name at about the age of two and a half years of age. Okay. Oh, wrong way. One more time. So there's four schools of Tibetan Buddhism, and we'll get to these a little bit more as we go along. Um, Nyingma means old school. It was the original teachings that came out of India from the historical Buddha. Um, Nyingma refers to the old school. Sakya is one that I'm most affiliated with. Most of my teachers over the years have been Sakya masters, Sakya lamas. Um, Sakya means gray earth in Tibetan. Gelug um, is uh, the school that I was ordained under. It's the same school that His Holiness the Dalai Lama belongs to. Kagyu is um, also one of the four schools. But a fifth school that started in the late 1800s has come into existence, and it's called Rime. 
And Rimei is a non-sectarian um, form of Buddhism. And, and proponents of the Rimei school, students of the Rimei school, have usually had um, teachers from all four major traditions, uh, which is the case in, in, with me. I consider myself Rimei. I consider myself a, re, uh, a Rimei Buddhist, non-sectarian, because I have had teachers from all four major schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, <clears throat> although the ones that I'm most affiliated with are Yelu because of my ordination, Sakya because most of my teachers have been from the Sakya lineage, and then the rest of them have mostly been from the Nyingma. I've only had two teachers from the Kagyu lineage. Whoa, I'm still going the wrong way. Sorry about that. Okay, so where is Tibet? Tibet is a country, a very large country. Okay. <laughs> there, okay there, there we go. So where is Tibet? Tibet is smack dab in the middle of, of what China considers to be hers. Okay. I know you guys have seen all these recent news articles, everything that's going on with the Olympic torch relay. Um, this really has to do with the large number of Tibetans and Tibet supporters throughout the world that are really unsatisfied with what has happened in mainland Tibet since the Chinese Communist government invaded back in the 1950s. Um, we don't get to hear a lot about it because China suppresses a lot of the information that comes out of that particular country. So Tibetan Buddhism. Is it a religious practice or an academic study? If it was a religious practice, the goal is to provide a service within a faith-based community. As an academic study, it has as its goal the contribution of knowledge for the greater good of society. I personally tend to adhere to the fact that Buddhism, I don't consider a religion. I honestly don't. There's a lot of religious aspects to it. I have discovered over the years that it is really more of a philosophy. It's a way of life. It is a way of thinking, of living, and of transforming the thoughts that you have in your mind so that they are more compassionate, more loving, and more peaceful. So if you were to look at it as a religious practice, why do we need to have Buddhism? Why do we need a religious practice in our lives today? First of all, we live in one of the most material countries on the planet, the United States. We're obviously a very materialistic country. Materialism does not bring lasting happiness. We all know, let's say you go buy a car, okay? The exciting prospect of a brand new car, the smell of the leather, it drives really well, you know? The, everything works. You know, I, not everything works in my car. So, um, it doesn't bring lasting happiness. It might bring momentary, momentary happiness. You might be excited about the fact of the smells, excited about the fact that it drives so well, excited of the newness of the car. It might last for a year, might last for a couple of years, but eventually something goes wrong in that car and you come up with some dissatisfaction regarding the fact that you have this brand new car. Oh, my car's not so new or someone scratched at the parking lot today. Something brings some sort of dissatisfaction around the owning of that car. More material wealth that we seem to possess, the more fear and anxiety seem to arise. Um, I'm always afraid of things getting stolen. I don't know why. Um, but I'm afraid if I leave something somewhere that someone's going to take it. Same thing happens here. The more we have, the more we fear. The bigger the house, the stronger the locks, the bigger the alarm system. Okay? Same thing goes. It's, it's, it's the same kind of momentary happiness. So what is Buddhism? This is a, uh, this is a petroglyph, a rock carving, and that's actually called monkey mind. We refer in Buddhism, there's a lot of times that we hear, uh, we refer to people's minds, especially your own mind, as a wild, untamed animal, whether it's an elephant or a monkey. Those are the two I use a lot, a wild elephant or a wild monkey, I a drunk monkey I like, actually. I've seen drunk monkeys. They're not funny at all, trust me. <coughs> so what is Buddhism? It came from India. It came from one person's experience. There's a general agreement that there's about 350 million um, people in the world that consider themselves to be Buddhist, which is 
around 6% of the world population. And if you were considered under the schools of religion, it would be the fourth largest after Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism. So where did Buddha come from? And who is he? Who was he? Buddha actually was born in the nether regions of present-day India and Nepal, which is kind of right about here. Um, the capital of the area that he lived in was called, he, the area he lived in was called Magadha. He, the capital was Kapilavastu. Buddha was born in a place called Lum, Lumbini, which is just a few miles outside of the capital. Um, this didn't show up very well, but this would be Kapo, Kapilavastu right here, and this would be Lumbini right here. So the space is not very far. Buddha spent most of his, the historical Buddha spent most of his life in this area right here. So right on the edge of the Himalayan mountains. So Siddhartha Gautama Shakyamuni. He was born in Lumbini, northern India, present-day Nepal, in 563 BC. He was born into royalty, not quite what we imagine royalty today as like the king and queen of England. Um, but think of like the mayor of Eugene as a king. Okay, that's kind of what his, his father was like. His father was a, was a mayor of a very large area, uh, probably the equivalent of Eugene and Springfield nowadays. Um, so he was born into this royal family. He was this, known as the sage of the Shakya clan. Shakya is the family name. Muni means sage. So Shakya Muni, sage of the Sak Sakya clan. He lived to about the age of 80. The historical Buddha, this is uh, the stupa in Lumbini, actually. When Buddha was born, his father was very concerned um, that he wasn't going to have the kind of life that his father wanted him to have. Uh, he brought many sages, many wise people that came and talked to him over the birth of his son. This is what rich people back in India and Nepal did back then. One of the most famous sages, his name was Atisa, came and um, when he held the child in his hands, he started crying. And he didn't stop crying for a long time and this worried Buddha's father, Shaki, uh, Siddhartha's father. Siddhartha's father came up to Atisa afterwards and said, what's wrong? Why, why are you crying? Why do you burst into tears when you hold my baby? You know, this isn't cool, I don't like this. And he says, well, I got two things to tell you. Your son is either gonna grow up to be a very famous leader a very great ruler, respected by all other rulers, or he's going to grow up to be a mendicant, a wise man, a, a sage, uh, a wandering holy man, a sadhu. And he's crying, and he says, I can't stop crying because I really think he's going to grow up to be this holy man. I think he's going to grow up to be this holy man, and I'm not going to live long enough to be able to hear him preach. That's why I'm crying. So his father didn't like this news. Siddhartha's father really didn't want him to grow up to be a holy man. He wanted him to grow up and rule his, prim, his, his, his kingdom. He wanted him to take after his old man dad. So um, he did everything he could to surround him with luxury. He gave him palaces, more than one, three, I think historically is, is the, as the story goes. So three palaces, one to spend the winter in, one to spend the summer time in, and one to spend the rest of the time in. And they would move around from each palace to palace as the weather changed. Um, and that's what he did. He kept his son, Siddhartha, walled up in luxury. Everything he wanted. And back then, we're talking dancing girls, music, perfume, scented baths, flowers all the time, but all within a wall. Never saw the outside of these palaces. Whenever he traveled between the palaces, he traveled in a palanquin, a closed a closed. Uh, you guys know what a palanquin is, right? Okay. Um, Siddhartha went this way for 29 years, got married, had a son, Rahula. Um, didn't know what was outside the, the gates of the office walls, but at the age of 29, he became curious. He really wanted to see what was going on beyond the palace, what was going on out in the real world, okay? So he begged his, his, his horse person, his personal attendant, to, to saddle his horse, and he decided to leave the comfort of the palace walls. And so that's what he did. He left. 
the comfort of his palace walls. So one of the first things he saw was an old person. Okay, this is and he gets hated by this person right here. His next three are drawings. So this is an old person. He had never seen an old person. Can you imagine going all your life and never seeing a person that was wrinkled, that was hunched, that had to walk with a cane, that had skin sagging off of them? You know, just an old person. Okay. Never had ever seen anything like this. So he asked his, his attendant, Chandaka, he said, what is this? What is this person? He said, this is an old person. He says, oh, really? Could this happen to me? He says, yeah, this is going to happen to you. And that really worried Siddhartha. He went out again, and he saw a sick person laying in the streets. Again, he asked his attendant, and he said, is this going to happen to me? I've never seen a sick person. I've never never been exposed to anything. I mean, just imagine, seriously, think about it right now. Never seen someone that was sick, never going to the hospital. That was the hospital back then, was laying out in the streets pretty much. Third time he went out, he saw a dead person. In India, the dead aren't quite carried nicely like that. They actually wrap them up in white sheets and just carry them right on their shoulders um, down to the ghats, the river. He had never seen a dead person. I would imagine there's probably one or two people in here who haven't seen a dead person, right? Has anyone here not seen a dead person? Not one. Okay, well, I'm wrong. So imagine, try to put yourself in his place, though. Imagine never seeing a dead person. This was completely new, unheard of to him. And he was afraid. He grew really afraid. He says, can this happen to me? He says, yeah, everybody is going to die at some point. Long way. So the fourth sight, he went out one more time, and he saw Sadhu, a wandering mendicant. These are pictures of two current mendicants. Um, they both, this is, this person's what's known as a sky-clad one. They don't wear any clothes. They cover their bodies in ashes and walk around completely naked, except for their trinkets. And this is, uh, this is a pretty typical Sadhu nowadays. So he decided that the way of the mendicant was the way to go. This person who's calm, seems happy, doesn't have a lot of things. That's what I want to be, you know? I don't need all this palace wealth. So he decided, I want to be happy. What's going to, be, what's going to make me the happiest? Getting out of the castle and living the life as a wandering ascetic. Well, this is actually a statue of, of Buddha after his first five years of wandering in the forests and living life as a as an ascetic. Um, he grew quite skinny. He ate one grain of rice a day. Some say he ate one grain of mustard seed as well. And that was it. He existed on it. He was proud of himself because he could touch his belly and touch his spine. He was incredibly proud of that. But it almost cost him his life. That was the problem, is that he was starving to death he was growing weak, his mind wasn't working properly, and he realized that. And so he said, living the life of an ascetic and starving yourself is not the way to go. So he left the group of people that he was working with, there was, there was five of them, they were all living together in the forest, and he went off on his own. When he went off on his own, he went and sat under what we know as a Bodhi tree, or the tree of enlightenment. It's a Kalos people tree, it's a fig tree. It's a big, big huge fig tree. Um, the original one doesn't stand anymore, but there was a, a branch that was taken off the original tree, taken to Sri Lanka. The Sri Lanka tree grew in prosperity. It's still there today. And they've actually taken branches from that tree and brought them back to India. So the original tree is not the original tree, but it's, it's, it's still there. When he came up after his second sitting, after he left his, his friends, he sat for another uh, period of time and became what they say is enlightenment. He became enlightened. He came up with a theory, several theories actually. One of them, it's not a theory actually, they, they're indisputable as far as I'm concerned. The Four Noble Truths. There are sufferings. Sufferings are sometimes misinterpreted as, um, well there's many different ways to look at this. Uh, there's suffering, there's 
unsatisfactory occurrences. We all have unsatisfactory occurrences. Uh, wake up in the morning and our hair isn't quite right. I don't have to worry about that. Um, you, can, you can miss your makeup or your coffee spills in the car on your way to school or work. Something happens that, that kind of upsets you. That's what is considered as suffering. There's sources to the suffering. There is a cause to the suffering. Um, one of the, and, and, you know, we're talking about close to 3,000 years of wisdom, and I, I can't go into it in depth, so we're really just scratching the surface. But these are the four fundamental things that he came up with. So there's suffering. There's true sources of suffering. There is a cessation. Oh, whoops. <laughs> I put two of those up there, didn't I? Okay, so there is a, um, there is a cessation to suffering. There is an end to suffering. There is an end to these unsatisfactory occurrences in our lives. There is an end to the anger, to the madness, to the depression, whatever you want to look at it as suffering in your life, there is an end to it. And then the fourth noble truth was the path that leads to the cessation of these of the suffering. And that path is the eightfold noble path. And these are what Buddha taught. These are the first two things that he taught after reaching his enlightenment was the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path. His first teaching is known as the turning of the wheel of Dharma. So you'll see a lot of um, Buddhist, in, in Buddhist symbology, um, you'll often see this, this ship's wheel. Um, it has eight spokes on it, which represents the Eightfold Noble Path. So right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. The first two are parts of what we consider in the Buddhist realm uh, wisdom teachings. So right view, this is the understanding and recognition of life being full of unsatisfactory circumstances. Um, and don't just take me at face value just because I'm standing up here in front of robes and telling you this. The Buddha said that out of all the teachings, especially when it comes to the Eightfold Noble Path, is that you have to treat this like a, a, a piece of gold. You have to take it, you have to examine it, you have to rub it, you have to put it between your teeth and make sure it's real. You have to incorporate this into your own lives to find the truth of this. So don't just you know, listen to me just because I'm up here. So this is something you cultivate through teachings and meditation with something that we call insightful wisdom. Right intention, also known as right thought or correct motivation, this is the actual action aspect of the wisdom teachings. This is the commitment that you make to mental, ethical, and um, self-improvement. Right speech, this is where we also, uh, this is under the ethic teachings. Um, ethical conduct is a guide to moral discipline, which is a foundation for other aspects of the path. This is exactly what it sounds like. It's all about our words. We all know how our words can hurt others. We all know how our words can affect others. It can either make them happy or not make them happy. It can either upset them or not upset them. It can have calming effects or it can have antagonistic effects. Okay, We know this. This is why we pay attention to our speech. Um, and this is, also brings up another view, foundation for other aspects of the path. One of the neat things that I have found in Tibetan Buddhism is that every, it's like a, it's like a layer of onions. You peel one layer and there's always something more. You learn something, you may not understand it right now, you may not click, it may not resound in your mind, you may not feel it in your heart. Somewhere down the road, something else in another teaching will say, oh, okay, this all falls into place. That's the way it works for me at the very least. Right action. Avoid causing harm through your actions. Unwholesome actions lead to unhealthy minds. Right, livelihood. This is a big one, especially for monks here in the West. How to earn a living. One of the best things to do is service to others. Uh, hospitality work, hospital work, medical work. Um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama stresses, stresses medical work. If you can't do something like that, at least be honest in your dealings with others. Try not to bring any harm to others. You don't want to have a job that it is like killing animals. You don't want to be a butcher. You, know? you don't want to... Um, some people don't want to drive a car because you're running over lots of bugs, insects, and killing things along the way, or the potential of hitting something even. Um, 
So right livelihood is an incredibly important thing. Right effort. Without effort, you cannot achieve your aims or your goals. So don't be lazy about what you're doing. Keep at it. It's one of the big things about Buddhism that I've discovered is a lot of people are interested in Buddhism, but they aren't interested in the work that comes with Buddhism. And there's a lot of work. It is, um, it's not an easy path to take. Right mindfulness, pay attention to your actions at all times. Right concentration, it allows you to focus more directly, your full attention on wholesome thoughts and wholesome actions. Also helps in school. One of my favorite teachers used to say, mind is your enemy or your very best friend. And I've heard other teachers say this as well. I didn't do this, I swear. <laughs> so if you allow your mind to run wild, it obviously becomes an enemy. You know, we all know that we do things or say things or act out certain ways, when we're, especially when we're angry, when we're upset, okay? or pissed at someone else, perhaps. Um, but if you eliminate these negative patterns and work on these negative patterns, you can produce a calm mind. And your calm mind, as we all know, is definitely one of your friends. Uh, where was I going? Karma. <coughs> Karma is, this started out to be a slide about some different um, key points in Tibetan, in Buddhism in general, that maybe you guys have heard. I don't think I made it past a karma slide. Um, karma, everyone's heard of karma. Karma is, is, is the law of cause and effect. And basically, um, karma is what doesn't allow you to get away with things that you would like to get away with, okay? This means that you are responsible for your, for your own life. Your own actions cause other actions, okay? I think there's the scientific principle is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, okay? Same thing happens with your mind. Okay. Last but not least, well, as far as the slideshow goes, I wanted to go over some common misconceptions of Buddhism. One of them is only for Asian people. Okay. You don't have to be born in Asia to be a Buddhist. You don't have to be a Buddhist to get away from Christianity, Jainism, Hinduism, Muslim, whatever, Islam. You can be all at once. Okay. Buddha is God, or is a God. And as I said earlier, we know that's not true. Buddha was just a person, just like everyone sitting in this room. He just came to some certain understandings and realizations. Uh, uh, Y'all. Sorry. Okay. Mm. Buddhists are idol worshippers. And I set up a little Buddhist shrine up here, and we'll go over that very briefly as well. Um, Buddhists are not idol worshippers, okay? I don't worship Buddha, okay? I don't worship anything on this table up here, okay? I just want you guys to know that. Statues, pictures, reliquaries, these are all things that remind us of our true, inherent Buddha nature. Okay, these are only reminders. We do not pray to them. Okay, we use them in, in certain rituals. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a very scientific person. I, I just want to let you guys know this and preface what anything else I'm about to say is. I like things I can touch, see, feel, taste, hear, smell, see in person. Okay? I'm a very scientifically minded person. I, I don't, um, Buddha never, the historical Buddha, Siddhartha never, uh, went for anything ritualistic. He wasn't into that himself. And um, I'm not so much. But there is a methodology to the rituals. Um, and there is a very definitive cause and effect to doing these rituals. You have to be a Buddhist to use any of its methods. Not true. Okay? If there's anything in Buddhism, if there's anything in any teaching, any wisdom teaching, any ethical teaching that you hear that resounds inside of you and you choose to incorporate that in your own life, by all means do so. Okay? That's the whole thing. You can still be a Christian and be a Buddhist. You can still be Jewish and still be Buddhist. 
Okay. It's just little things that you incorporate into your own lives that make you a better, more compassionate person. That's all. My favorite one. Buddhists, and this is the last one too. Buddhists never get angry. What a load. <laughs> okay? Buddhists get angry. I was born here in the West. I was raised here in the West. Happened to live in India for three and a half years. I lived in another foreign country for two years. I get angry. Just because I'm a monk doesn't mean I'm not human. Okay? Means that I don't get angry like I used to get angry. Okay? But it doesn't mean I don't get angry. It just maybe doesn't last as long or manifest itself in the same way it used to. And I think that was it. So a couple of the things I just wanted to explain up here in the shrine um, and go over. That's very bright. Thank you. Buddhists are um, very sound oriented, especially Tibetan Buddhists. There's a lot of noise in Tibetan Buddhism. There's bells, there's whistles, there's gongs, um, beautiful noises. I think it's a beautiful noise. It's a Tibetan singing bowl, usually used to signify the beginning or end of a teaching or an event. Um, I know that there's a couple of teachers here at the University of Oregon that use um, noise like this at the beginning of class to signify the start of, of a teaching session. I think that's really neat. Buddhists believe, some Buddhists believe that um, mantrayanas, uh, they are uh, sayings that you say over and over, mantras, like Om Mani Padme Hom, everyone's I'm sure heard that, or at least Om uh, is a seed syllable mantra. Um, believes, a lot of Buddhists believe that there's something in these syllables, in these mantras, that resound at the very core of a human being. And if they resound at the core of a human being, they also resound with the same sound that the earth makes. Okay? That there's some sort of general noise, a, a, a humming that the earth makes and produces. And by saying these mantras, you can get in touch with these primordial um, feelings that go along with that. So noise is a big one. Bells, <laughs> drums, these are damaroos. Very loud, they can be. Um, these are a couple of pictures of my teachers. Um, this is a right spiraling white conch, which is supposed to be a very auspicious. I'm not a very good person at playing it. There's also other things like um, thigh bones, which have been made into trumpets as well. I'm not warmed up. No, it's actually um, the thigh bone instrument and this particular damaru are used in a, um, a practice called chud. And chud is an obstacle clearing practice uh, which is meant to relieve anything that's in your way, such as a bad grade or uh, you got in a car accident or you're about to do a speech and you're really nervous about it. And so during the practice of chud, you actually um, visualize that your own body is being cut up and offered to these people that are harming you. It's a very intense practice. Um, so this actually, this is a real thigh bone, came from a real Tibetan practitioner actually. Um, purbas, a lot of the things that we use here, um, especially in Tibet, Tibet had an, had an original uh, religion called Bon. And when the Tibetan Buddhism came and introduced to Tibet from India, um, they took a lot of the teachers that came, took a lot of the Bon traditions and transformed them into their own traditions. And so a lot of the things up here are uh, originally from the Bon tradition, like this purba. Um, actually, this used to be a tent stake. Actually, they, they use it, a very heavy stake. And they took it and made it into a ritualistic instrument. Um, but it's just a reminder, you know, the sword of Manjushri. This is a sword that cuts through the obstacles that obscure wisdom. Okay. Also has a, a Vajra on the end, kind of like this, which signifies uh, a thunderbolt. Um, Tibetan Buddhists are 
in constant contact with other forms of religion, especially in India. I lived in Dharamsala, where there were Jains, Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, and Tibetan Buddhists, all very, very active in a very small community. Um, so it's wonderful. You get to learn and interact with all these other uh, people and religions, and I, I really enjoyed my time there. Um, so usually on a Tibetan shrine, at least on mine, there's several, this is a lingam stone from India. Um, this is used in a Shiva lingam, um, but it was given to me by a sadhu, and since then I've always kept it on my, my shrine. It's a, it's a holy object in Hinduism. We also have other, other things like tingshas, always lots of, lots of noise. Um, butter lamps, these are butter lamps. They're normally filled with ghee or clarified butter, and then you make a cotton, a wick out of a raw cotton, and you roll it up and stick it in there, and you burn these at all times, usually on a shrine. And Mahakala, this is one of the protector deities of Tibetan Buddhism. And then there's seven bowls in front, and these are, these are actually water offering bowls. And for me, at my own shrine at home, um, I actually will clean the water bowls daily at night, I'll dump them out and turn them over, wipe them out, and in the morning I'll fill them every day. Um, and this is a, it's called water offering, so I'm offering it to all the protector uh, deities, which you know, keep me uh, and my vows, my ordination vows, uh, protected. And last, uh, I think that's about it. I don't have anything else to say. Does anyone have any? Yeah, please. This one? This is just a, it's a lingam stone. It's used in a Hindu, it's used in Hindu ritual. And um, he wasn't, he was kind of one of my teachers. He wasn't an official teacher. But ever since then, since he gave it to me as a gift, and it's a revered Hindu um, religious object, I've kept it on my own personal shrine. That's all. Apologize for my, my name. No, 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 no. Like, right. It's not often you get to talk with a mom. Well, you know, I really so. appreciate this, but I see orange in your table dressing here, and I see orange from you. Sure. And can you, what, it feels vibrant and. Perfect like, question. That's a, sun, or that's a great question. It has nothing to do with the sun. Has, yeah, yeah, no, nothing at all. Um, actually, what it, the, the colors of the robes, um, maroon seems to be pretty indigenous to Tibet. Okay. The original Buddhist robes were either brown, an ochre color, or a um, uh, kind of an off yellow. And those were the most common dyes that were available back then. Um, the color, this, this is the most common color, and this is probably um, the color that would be more appropriate to wear if I was in Sri Lanka or Burma, someplace like that. Thailand, the forest monks, the th all, most of the Theravadan tradition wear, wear robes that look like this color or close to this color. Um, in the Tibetan tradition, <coughs> Tibetans are a weird bunch. Okay? They're, they're, they're definitely different than any other Buddhist tradition you guys will ever come across. They eat meat. Okay? They're not vegetarians. Um, they eat a lot of meat, actually. There's not a lot that grows at the, in Tibet, you know, you're, you're talking the Tibetan plateau, the average height is 17,500 feet. Okay, that's higher than Mount Hood, okay, than the top of Mount Hood. So not a lot grows there. Barley is the big thing. Wheat doesn't even grow at that, at that altitude. So their main staple of food is, is meat and uh, barley, roasted barley. Um, so the colors in the robes, to get back to that, actually came about... Um, from Chinese monks. Um, there came a time when Buddha Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha, were almost wiped out completely in northern India as well as in Tibet. And when they was being reintroduced and they wanted uh, to ordain their, their monks, they couldn't find enough monks. You have to have a, a quorum of monks to have an ordination. Um, and they actually came across some Chinese monks, which were wearing blue robes, blue and brown. And ever since then, um, Tibetan monks have always had this blue pinstripe on the sleeves of their shirts. But as far as the color goes, um, there's nothing real significant to the color. It's just how it came about in Tibet. 
Tibet's also tend to dress warmer. We have many layers of clothes. Um, at that altitude, it's very cold as well. I see Kevin chomping at the bit. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's okay. No, 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 that's okay. There's probably more time for questions. There are, yeah. I just, I think they said eight we have. Okay, thank you. Feel free to keep asking questions. Any, any more questions so far? No, really? No? Okay. Sure, sure. Um, so when you do go out in public, you said you don't wear the robe. Only here at school. Okay. Only here at school. Everywhere else, you usually see me in a robe. Okay. Um, if you see me, I don't go out that much. So I'm usually at the, at the, we have a Dharma Center here in town um, where we practice. And, and my card, I have cards up here for you guys if anyone that's interested in emailing or calling or interested further. So, um, but yeah, other than school, I pretty much wear my robes everywhere. In school, uh, I had people were stopping me and talking to me, or just, it was just really distracting. So, distracting to me, too. So, so what do you wear? It's like jeans and a t-shirt? Jeans and a t-shirt. All right. So, look just like you. Yeah. Um, monks, technically, were supposed to wear brown pants and the colors up top. So it could either be yellow or red or maroon or something. I'm... You know, I'm an Oregonian for the most part. I, I, I wear jeans and a t-shirt, so. Can you talk a little bit about your vows? Are there seven vows and seven waterfalls? No. Um, the ordination vows, actually, there's two levels of ordination. There's a novice ordination, which you usually take for one to three years before you take your full ordination. Novice vows consist of about 10 vows. It's not that hard to keep. Full ordination, there's 277 of them. So, and it's very strict. We have to recite them daily. And once a month, we also have a confession. So you have to go over any of your transgressions and correct them and admit them as well. So two other monks. Yeah, you have, again, there has to be a, a quorum of monks to do this. Needless to say, I haven't had confession in quite some time. So it's been since, let's see, my last, it was probably in uh, November, I think, was the last time that we had the requisite amount Monk. Are you the only one in no, in my center, yes. I'm the only ordained in my center. Here in Eugene, there's five of us all together. Three of three of them are Tibetan. The other are Zen monks. So that is a quorum, but we often don't. Yeah, we don't get together too much. So. Do you have to go to Tibet to learn the best? Say that again. Do you have to go to Tibet to learn? Not at all. The most important thing to do is to be able to find a qualified teacher, though. You need to really examine. They say in Tibet that you examine your teacher's qualities for seven years before you choose them as a teacher. It's impossible here in the West. It's, it doesn't really happen so much even in India and Tibet nowadays anymore. Um, but usually you, you, you really observe a teacher for about a year before you take, make a formal commitment to a teacher. So. Sorry, I think we have That's okay. That's okay. Please thank us. Thank you. Thank you.